Hey everybody, this is the review from September 9th in our MCB class and I'm just going to go over the worksheet that we did as well as the thing that really tripped everyone up, the P-mediated, P-element mediated transformation and hopefully clear things up for everyone. We had these beginning fertilized eggs and we were given three different stainings of A, B, and C proteins in the wild type up above and we wanted to find out what the relationship was between A, B, and C. Doing that, we look at different mutations. First, we start with the knocking down of B. Up above in wild type B, we see where it's expressed. Then when we stain for A in our B knockdown, we see that there is no A where it should be as in the wild type. So therefore, we can directly conclude that B, when it's absent, somehow affects the expression of A. That when B is absent, so is A. Therefore, we conclude that B somehow promotes the expression of A, and we can assign notation as such as B arrow to A, B promotes A. The next mutation is the overexpression of B. Drawn in, I drew B all over the egg, and we see that there's A expression as well, shaded region, as well as the A's that I drew in, because we're staining for A, as you see on the left. So what we just concluded was that B promotes A. So if B present is present, then so should A. However, we see there's a distinct region where B is present, but A is not. And why is that? Well, if we were to focus more on our wild types, we see that the third protein, C, is normally present in that striped region. When we mutate B, it's important to realize that we're not affecting C at all. So C's normal expression is where it was when we stained for it. Just because we're not staining for it doesn't mean it's not there. So that's why I went ahead and drew in the C's where they should be normally. So now we can kind of see that there's a new relation forming. There's C and B present in that stripe, but no A. So even though B is promoting A, the presence of C is somehow suppressing A. Therefore, we can c conclude this diagram down at the bottom here with B arrow to A, but C suppresses B, or C suppresses A, I'm sorry, with that block. The final two mutants only further conclude and support this hypothesis. In the first one, we see a knockdown of C, so there, there is no C anywhere. Drawing in the normal expression of B, as shown in the wild type up top, we see that there's staining for A, the shaded region, as well as the written in A's, are right where B's are. That makes sense. B promotes A. And since there's no C presence at all, A can freely, freely be expressed. So further supports that B promotes A. However, in the final one, with the overexpression of C, I drew in C everywhere, and bringing down the wild type staining of B in its normal domain, we see that there's no longer an A in that striped region. And this further concludes that C suppresses A. But this also brings up another important point, that the suppression activity of C is actually greater than that of the promotion activity of B, because they both are present in that segment. Yet the activity of C wins over the promotion activity of B. Since there is no A, we can assume that C is acting stronger on A than B is. Just a little tidbit to know about. Now just imagine doing that for the huge pathway such as this. This is the uh, P10 pathway, but they're fun as we all know. In real life, they're not as simple as A, B, and C. So let's focus on the main thing that everyone got confused on. The P element mediated transformation. And this was an an answer to how do we overexpress a gene in an embryo if we want to see what it does or just for any reason express it a lot. It's done through this transformation process. To fully understand this process, it's important to begin at a beginning concept. And that con concept is how plasmids work. Now down below I drew a few cells with nuclei in the bottom. Up above there is a plasmid. A plasmid, for those of you who do not know, 
is circular DNA that is taken from some, some type of creature such as Drosophila. And we can alter this circular DNA by inserting a gene of interest. Up above, I indicated that as GOI, gene of interest. So the gene of interest, what we want to express, is put into this plasmid. Then we take this plasmid and put it into our cell. Inside our cell, the plasmid actually goes into the nucleus. For as I just stated, the plasmid is nothing but DNA, so where else will DNA go? Inside the nucleus, we now have this plasmid DNA, as well as host DNA, shown there at the bottom with the DNA structure. All throughout the time, host DNA has normal expression patterns that go on that won't be affected by inserting our plasmid. Because of that, we need to realize that all the mechanics and energy and components needed to express DNA are present inside that nucleus. And we just put in plasmid DNA. So you bet that that gene of interest is going to be expressed already on its own. It has the promoter region, and it's inside there, and it will be expressed. However, this is not the full effect that we wanted, because this type of experiment, we want full sustainable overexpression growth. Over time, plasmids get degraded, and once it gets degraded, the gene of interest will no longer be expressed. So we somehow want to get the properties of host DNA where it's incorporated into the host and continually gets expressed. But how do we get to there? How can we get that type of property for our gene of interest? The answer is p-element mediated transformation. This is done by two plasmids instead of one. Just as before, we have one plasmid on the left up above that has our gene of interest that we want to express. And on the right, we have a plasmid that contains coding for a transposase, ACE indicating that it's an enzyme, meaning it's going to do some activity. We will uh, transport both of those into our cell, and they'll both go to the nucleus. And just as before, they are both DNA inside of a nucleus full of RNA polymerase and all that good stuff. So they will be transcribed and expressed. The gene of interest will make some gene of interest mRNA or proteins. Similarly, the transposase will be transcribed and make the transposase enzyme protein shown in the top right in blue. But it's important to remember that this is all temporary expression and will not continue forever. It'll go away. This is where the transposase comes into play. The function of transposase is to come into the nucleus and take out the gene of interest from our other plasmid and insert it into the host DNA, therefore giving our gene of interest the full properties of host DNA expression, meaning it will not terminate. So even though our plasmids and transposed proteins will eventually degrade, our gene of interest DNA coding strand is fully in the DNA and will be transcribed. The P element, it's important to notice, is in reference to on the left and right sides of our gene of interest are P elements, just parts of the sequence that allow transposase to pick up as kind of handles and then deposit it into the DNA. So now with our gene of interest coding region fully implanted, inherited into the host DNA, we will get sustain sustainable long-term expression of our gene of interest. We made sure to put it in with a good promoter, so it will get promoted and be expressed a lot. However, this is not the full experiment. This is only the first half. Remember that DNA has two alleles, one maternal, one paternal. And our gene of interest only got inserted into one strand. And this is where you can start to think of it as a recessive trait. If we want to get full overexpression, sustainable, it needs to be on both alleles to always be expressed. So what we have essentially created at this point is a heterozygous Drosophila, where one allele is gene of interest and the other one is wild type, and indicated it with GOI slash wild type. But what we want is something that has homozygous gene of interest slash gene of interest. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of heterozygous flies. Why don't we cross them together? So we'll take a 
male fly and a female fly. Hopefully those are the sexes or else this won't work most likely. And both of them are heterozygous, for that's just what we created. And when they engage in romance of the drosophilic kind, they will make a bunch of babies. And as we know, two heterozygous parents that go and make offspring will create three different options. Homozygous, heterozygous, and then homozygous for the other gene, or better expressed in how I drew in here, plus minus, plus plus, and minus minus. Our plus plus, which indicated as gene of interest slash gene of interest, is what we want. And the great thing is, some of the offspring will be homozygous, and it's exactly what we want. Some of the offspring will be plus plus gene of interest slash gene of interest. We'll have both copies of the DNA coding region and will fully express our gene of interest over and over again in specific regions of the fly. It's important to note that, sure, a bunch of other babies will be made that are plus minus and minus minus, but hopefully our gene of interest has some sort of phenotypic trait that makes it easy to isolate the flies that have this genotype of plus plus. And so bringing it all together, we went from plasmids being incorporated into DNA and transcribing into transposase, bringing gene of interest into the host DNA, and then getting both alleles of host DNA to be, uh, to be having the gene of interest leading to full overexpression of our gene. And this is where we get to at the end of P element mediated transformation, the full transformation and expression of our gene of interest that was within a P element domain of our plasmid. So we reached the end of this and hopefully it cleared things up a bit. If it doesn't, go back a little bit and watch it again. If it still doesn't make sense, let me know and I'll try to clear it up for you. But hopefully this was a success and cleared it up for everyone. That's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you all in class.